The Legend of the Lone Ranger is a western adventure film released by Universal Pictures in the year 1981. Clinton Spilsbury would star as John Reed, along with Michael Horse as Tonto. Christopher Lloyd plays the villain Butch Cavendish, who ambushes a group of Texas Rangers at Bryant's Gap. John Reed is the lone survivor, thanks to his old childhood friend Tonto. Once Tonto helps him recuperate from the underhanded attack, Reed takes on the mantle of the Lone Ranger. I have a feeling you're going to be a very important lawyer. I just want to make sure the West has an honest system of justice. Also in the year 1981, a subsequent newspaper strip from the New York Times Syndicate was released. Written by Carrie Bates and containing art from Russ Heath, the strip ran until the year 1984. Pure Imagination Publishing collected certain stories from this run in comic book format by the year 1993. Topps Comics would eventually publish an excellent four-issue comic book miniseries by the year 1994 called The Lone Ranger and Tonto. The story, titled It Crawls, is written by Joe Joe R. Lansdale, with pencils from his frequent collaborator, Timothy Truman. Primarily, It Crawls is a deconstruction of the Lone Ranger mythos that comic books have become well known for since the mid-1980s. It also mixes genres having elements of science fiction and the supernatural in the main context of a western. The two creators are also known for their work on other western-themed comic books, such as Jonah Hex, Two Gun Mojo, which is a miniseries from the DC Comics Vertigo imprint. Oh, are you joining the Rangers? No, sir. My brother. Some significant aspects of the Lone Ranger's origin are altered for the 1981 film. Prior to his stint as a Texas Ranger, John Reed has just finished law school and is on the way to becoming a lawyer. He meets a romantic love interest, one Amy Stryker, on the way back to the town of Del Rio, when he and Captain Dan Reed of the Texas Rangers find Amy's Uncle Lucas strung up and hung for a disparaging newspaper article written on the Cavendish Gang that they both head after them. So a major spin this puts on the Lone Ranger is that his status as a Texas Ranger was only honorific and instigated by love for a woman. John, where the hell are you going? With you. Well, let's get him. Cavendish is reimagined in this film as a former Union Army major who is vying for independence from the Union. The Cavendish gang is less of a gang and more like Cavendish's personal army. Tonto no longer speaks broken English, and while it is directly stated that white men were responsible for killing his wife and child, he still considers John Reed his trusted friend or Kimasabi. To this end, Tonto is the one who trains John Reed with the quote-unquote skills he'll need to become the Lone Ranger. When John Reed first starts out with a pistol, he is a horrible shot. But then Tonto gives him some silver bullets, and all of a sudden, he's an expert marksman. Try this. A silver bullet. It's more accurate. Who the hell writes this stuff? Anyway, according to Tonto, silver-tipped arrows make his people shoot with incredible accuracy, and this somehow extends to gunplay and bullets. Now, I realize this might not make any difference to your average Joe viewer, but I find this whole concept offensive. One would hope that the Lone Ranger's expert skills as a marksman were learned, not some magic superpower that comes from using different materials. It's the same problem I have with organic webbing versus mechanical mechanically built web shooters. While some view the change as minor, I feel like it intrinsically alters the character and who he is. Imagine if Batman fought like a complete klutz and then when Alfred hands him his utility belt, he becomes a master of 324 fighting arts. What happens when you take the belt away? Do his fighting skills become poor again? If the Lone Ranger doesn't use silver-made bullets, is he a crap shot? Can any old buddy use the Lone Ranger's twin Colts just as good as he can because they're filled with silver bullets? Stupid. Tribal chiefs first use silver on their arrows. Makes them fly longer and straighter. Silver is pure. It's been a symbol of justice and purity since the year of the sun. 
Silver is also the Lone Ranger's horse. Only in this film, he doesn't save him from death by Buffalo. He and Tonto free the wild horse from being trapped in a pit. Then we're treated to a somewhat awkward continuation of John Reed's quote-unquote training as he learns to ride Silver without being thrown into a river or something. Soon enough, or 60 minutes into the film, the Lone Ranger suits up and along with Tonto head back into Del Rio to locate Cavendish. In the meantime, Butch Cavendish plots to kidnap President Ulysses S. Grant by hijacking what is essentially Air Force One, but on a train. I always used to have a friend who would ask me why Char in Gundam and all the characters who take after him wear masks. This is probably the best answer I could give him. <laughs> why are you wearing a mask? <laughs> because I'm in hiding. The film is steeped in infamy based on the legal issues surrounding the eventual owner of the character, Jack Rather, and the star of the popular television series, Clayton Moore. Moore, like many stars, continued to make his living appearing as the character that made him famous in many public forums long after the television series had concluded its run. Rather, on the other hand, had obtained the rights to the character from creator Fran Stryker back in 1954 during the television series Heyday. With the event of the upcoming Legend of the Lone Ranger film on the horizon, Rather obtained a court order against Clayton Moore that prevented him from appearing in public with the Lone Ranger's trademark mask. Once word of the injunction reached the public, it is said to have made the current film very unpopular with moviegoers. Of course, as a five-year-old, I knew Zip zilch and nada about these legal shenanigans and simply enjoyed watching the film and playing with the excellent three and three fourths action figure line spawned by toy company Gabriel by the year 1982. I just chalk this up to yet another shady McShady underhanded Hollywood backlot story. Moore at least got to counter Sue and eventually won the battle by 1985 whereby he was able to resume public appearances as the Lone Ranger in costume. Meanwhile, the legend of the Lone Ranger was a financial and public relations disaster. No! In another dick move, all of Clinton Spilsbury's dialogue is dubbed over by actor James Keach. But apparently, even Andy Warhol thought Spilsbury was a little nutty in his promotional interviews, so maybe he wasn't as good-natured as the character he portrayed. Former Lone Ranger John Hart, who had a role as Lucas Stryker in the film, describes Spilsbury as, quote-unquote, the guy who was supposed to be the Lone Ranger, and how Spilsbury, quote-unquote, was such a disaster. Even even his co-star, Michael Horse, admits he was asked to remove Spilsbury from a physical altercation on set. Given that this was his first and his last role ever, somebody either had it out for the guy or he was a true pain in the ass to work with. No! No! One aspect of the film that I do have fond memories about is the merchandising. I remember enjoying the three and three fourths inch figures a great deal, especially their ability to holster their firearms and knives, which was something my Kenner Star Wars toys could not do. Even after my interest in Lone Ranger toys waned, my Tonto action figure still served as a stand-in for Spirit from the G.I. Joe toy line. While the movie hardly qualifies as a success, the three and three fourths inch line was pretty excellent and even sparked a mini revival of the nine inch dolls originally from the year 1973. I am Major Bartholomew Cavendish, and you, Mr. President, are my prisoner. So, Cavendish pretty much successfully captures the President of the United States because the Spilsbury Ranger is such a yutz. You'd think with guys like Buffalo Bill Cody, General George Armstrong Custer, and Wild Bill Hickok on Train Force One with President Grant, they could have done something to stop his abduction as well. Cavendish presents his own independent declaration to the President, who suggests one minor modification. 30 days is too long to give them. I'd change that. They'll dicker and debate and scratch their indecisive asses, and by the time they sober up, I'll be dead. Luckily, the Ranger and Tonto spring President Grant before that becomes a reality. They wire Cavendish's fort with tons of explosives and set them off to cover their escape. The President's entourage must have finally realized he was missing because General Custer and the whole gang show up with the U.S. Cavalry to take down the entire Cavendish militia. The Ranger and Cavendish have a final showdown where he decides not to kill him, and that's pretty much it. Look. 
it's not like this is the worst film I've ever seen, but keep in mind, this film was the nail in the coffin for the once popular franchise known as The Lone Ranger. There is, in fact, plenty to write home about with this movie. It's just nothing good. Your sins will be paid for in the fires of hell. and debate and scratch their indecisive asses and by the time they sober up I'll be dead. <laughs>